the Super Media Bros Podcast is a founding member of the Odd Pods Media Network. Super Media Bros. On paper, this should have been worth a fuck, but as we will shortly let everybody that's listening know, um, this felt like a very glorified house show slash glorified Monday Night Raw episode. Oh, you think it was glorified? I'm only saying glorified because of the stars and stripes and all that shit. So okay, fair enough. Yeah, presentation. Yeah. So, welcome to the Super Media Bros Podcast, where two best friends give comedically informative takes on movies, music, pro wrestling, and more. I'm Richie. I'm Devin, and we are back in our 30 year time machine series for the WWE slash WWF, and we are picking up where King of the Ring 1993 left off and rolling into Auburn Hills, Michigan for SummerSlam 1993. And for this episode. Our friend Russ from the Infectious Groove podcast slash music YouTube channel is going to join us because this man was actually in the crowd for this. And I have got to hear and you have got to hear the scarification, if you will, of the of this poor man's uh, soul and mind. <laughs> Russ, how's it going, dude? Uh, it's going. It's funny. We'll we'll go through this. I hated this event <laughs> so much <laughs> while I was at it that. I'm not okay. So in, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, you already know I'm of a certain age if I was at SummerSlam 93. Right. And then also you would have put together that I'm from Detroit originally. Okay. Having said that I have seen, I was there in person for some of the most rebroadcast and cool moments of the attitude era. Austin oh, wow. driving in the Zamboni. I was there like when wow. driving the light Zamboni, like I was there. Uh, we drove over to Albany. I saw Austin drive the, uh, uh, the milk truck in, or I mean, the, the beer truck. Uh, it was Angle that drove the uh, milk truck, but uh, Austin drives the beer truck in. Uh, I saw Rock throw a uh, stone cold, quote unquote, off the Ambassador Bridge when really it was just the bridge on Belle Isle in Detroit. But, you know, so I've, I've seen, in, I was there in person for some of the most rebroadcast moments in the history of the WWF slash WWE. I have not watched not one minute of this. SummerSlam again since the night that it happened in front of me at the palace. Like I've never even, I never even, I was in vengeance like uh, 2004, five, six, somewhere around there. There was a vengeance pay-per-view that was from uh, Joe Louis arena and it was nothing exciting to speak of. I've rewatched that like six times and <laughs> I never, I've never rewatched not one minute of this SummerSlam until I was rewatching it for this uh, podcast. Appearance. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. You you did this to him. I yeah. did this so to this you too. Your fault. I did this. Yeah. I did this to me. All right. I, I will I, tell you this though. And we'll go through it. We'll as we go through it. What's funny is what you said, Richie, about like on paper this should be good. And I not the not the main event. There's no saving the main event. And no. we'll get there. Like the main. Nobody care. I will tell you this. Absolutely no one in that place bought a ticket for that main event. Nope. Like nobody. Did. But the rest of it on paper should be good. Like for example, match by match. Last night, I kept being like, "Oh hell, this will be a barn burner!" Like, I don't, I don't know why I don't remember this match. You know what I mean? Like yep. with the lineup, with the with the lineup that was on the card, right? And then like the matches are just there. Like That's there's nothing. Felt. Like you, like you, you hit the nail on the head actually. And I didn't even think about it until you mentioned it. They're all like house show quality matches. Like if I told you that I was there to watch Mr. Perfect versus Shawn Michaels for this intercontinental strap. Wouldn't you be like, Oh, that all timer. Holy shit. Oh, what a, what a bad, right. Yep. But then like this match is just like Sean came to phone it in. And so did Kurt and Kurt never phoned it in, you yeah. know? Yeah. It's just so weird. It's such a weird event. Yeah. And I will get to what I think is surprisingly the best match on the card. And a lot of people out there might agree and they might disagree, but like, in my opinion, it was the best match on the card for what we got. Uh, so how we usually do this is we roll from the start all the way to the end. We're not going to fucking analyze this stuff, you know, beat for beat, because why would you, first of all, it's fucking SummerSlam 93. Secondly, we'd be here all night, pretty much shit talking it. So the opening contest is Razor Ramon versus the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase in a seven-minute and thirty-two-second singles match. Again, on paper, 
It's fucking Razor Ramon. It's Ted DiBiase. I mean, we got some pretty decent matches with um, IRS and Razor in later you mm-hmm. know, iterations for the uh, the IC strap or whatever. But this was decent for what it was. It's it's your typical shit heel Ted DiBiase and um, the bad guy, Razor. I mean, buy a ticket for Razor, of course, but it's like, <laughs> come on, man. Razor's had such better matches. I will, I will say that Razor Ramon is one of the reasons why I bought a ticket, like why I went to this event in the first place. Yep. No, Razor is great. And I told Richie this while we were watching it. I was like, to this day, Razor throws some of the best looking worked punches of all time. Yeah, yeah. Like, I he, agree. He's really, really good. And Ted DiBiase, like, you, you're not going to really go wrong with that. But like you said, dude, it was just too long for an opener. And to me, that's kind of like the, the the theme of the night is this is just too long for the what this is yeah of course i don't know anything about this match uh like the ins and outs of it or anything but i'm sure this isn't what it is but this match seems like they just kind of forgot what the finish was supposed to be and just kept going till somebody was like i don't know i guess this will just end it here you know yeah like it just seems like nobody really knew what the finish was supposed to be so they just kept being like i don't know let's do another move yeah and they struggled getting into the razor's edge for a hot second mm, like I, I, I thought dibiase was just gonna boom, just fall over like a goddamn twinkie honestly so, i will shit. say though and one thing because i've never heard heenan's commentary on the show right because mm-hmm. i uh, i was in the arena this is the only time i've ever seen it so i know i have never heard the commentary yeah he first of all, Heenan is on fire this entire show. Oh, a hundred percent. Like, like even, even even by Bobby Heenan standards, he's like a step above Heenan. Right, on this whole show. Right, and he's been that and, way the whole calendar year on these pay per views so far. Yeah, like some of the best shit that he's done with WWE. And what I, the thing that reminded me of that is he saves that terrible Razor's Edge by overselling the fact. Oh, I can't believe he got DiBiase and wow, you know, and it's like, <laughs> well, yeah, it should have been. Shouldn't have been that hard, but yeah, you know. But I like the way that Heenan, instead of Heenan, Heenan never detracts. No, he always adds mystique to it, right? Yeah. And he did, he did like you, me, and everybody else who's an educated viewer watches that and goes, Jesus Christ. But the way Heenan says it makes the average untrained viewer be like, oh, wow, that was a badass Razor's Edge, you know, when it wasn't, you know, right. Razor goes over the million dollar man, Teddy Biasi, in seven minutes and 32 seconds. And, uh, we go from that straight into a tag team match where it is the Steiner brothers versus uh, Jimmy Del Rey and Tom Pritchard of the heavenly bodies with Jim Cornette. And you know, my man's in the neck brace looking like Jim Cornette the whole fucking night, <laughs> you know, know. Um, but he can move pretty decently. I was laughing my ass off of that. Every time that man threw a promo up or every time he was at ring, he's like, I got a neck brace, but I won't move I my it. shit. Yeah, <laughs> I know the whole time I was like, now, if anybody in AEW did that same fucking shit, <laughs> he would light oh, their ass dude, on fire. Dude, I mean, everybody now lives by a different standard, right? Like, I <laughs> like I understand Jimmy Cornette's got some points of view. Yeah, but, <laughs> like, yeah. that's certainly saying something. <laughs> like, everybody now acts like they all were the greatest ever then. Yeah. They would do it. It's like, uh, bro, it's on tape. We can see you doing it wrong. You right. Know? Yeah. yeah, there really was not a whole bunch to write home about on this match. And that's sad well, because like f- individually and as tag teams, not against each other, they can work. It's a solid match for what it is. But I, well, I can- I'll tell you, here's what takes the air out of this match, in my opinion, just for being in the crowd. Here's what I can tell you. So they made obviously they always make a huge deal out of the Steiners being from uh, U of M, right? Yeah. From Ann Arbor, mm-hmm. Michigan. Yeah. Ann Arbor, Michigan is 20 minutes from the Palace of Auburn Hills. You think anybody, if there were people, there were people in the parking lot across the street that were like, uh, Steiners go over yet? You know what I mean? Like, you just, like, were you, was anybody expecting anything but the Steiners to go over huge in this match? Right. right. So, like, this is a match that even if it was a minute and a half squash, all of us in the place would have been like, okay, cool, that's over now. Like, you know, and also, no, you know, when you hear about, uh, a big band that's from your hometown. And you're like, I've never fucking heard of this band before. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like, I don't mean like when the white stripes were coming up, everybody in Detroit knew who they were. Right. But like Greta Van Fleet keeps claiming they're from Detroit, but like none of us from Detroit have ever heard of that band. Right. Like before they became big. Okay. Um, that's how it was with the Steiners. Like they kept forcing on us. They kept being like, you're your guys from U of M. And we were all like, we don't, 
none of us fucking grew up on these guys. Like at all, like none of us sit around watching U of M wrestling. You know what I mean? Right. Like, so they kept pushing that really hard. And we were like, well, the two things, one, we don't care. And two, we know they're going to go over. So like this, there's no point in even having this match be more than a minute and a half. And, yeah, and the match went nine minutes and 28 seconds. Well, hold on, Which, Russ. You want that to be a minute and a half. You know, they just would have given it to the main event. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's more time for people to lift up Lex Luger for no fucking Yeah, exactly. Reason. Right. Yeah. For a, for a stipulation that despite winning the match, he lost the stipulation, but we'll get there later. My, my wife, who is very new to sports entertainment, like within the last 12 months, we were watching oh, wow. this last night. And when they, when the bell rang, my wife, who's less than a year old in sports entertaining says, yeah, but he can't win the belt on a discount <laughs> or, or on a count or a disqualification. <laughs> And I was like, yep. So 14 and a half minutes late. Well, we'll get to the main event, but yeah. 14 and a half minutes later, she's like, but why are they all celebrating? Like, I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, we don't. We don't know. We 30 said, years yeah. later, I don't know. Yep. We said the same fucking thing. And that's that's exactly the takeaway from that. Dude, but, uh, you. Well, I got wait. Wait till we get to the main event. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's stuff I want to point out about yeah, the crowd. Yeah. So the Steiners go over uh, the heavenly bodies in nine minutes and 28 seconds. And it was um, and it was for the WWE Tag Team Championship. Like, you know, nobody like you said, dude, nobody bought into the heavenly bodies winning this. It was just, a, you know, they were glorified. And that's not taken away. That's from another them. thing, too. They were glorified. Exactly right. Yeah, it was it was it a was, glorified uh, enhancement talent at that point yeah it wasn't like they were up against demolition or somebody that they had mm -hmm. that had an actual shot at taking the straps right right speaking of like somebody with a shot at taking the strap we move on to the intercontinental championship match with Shawn michaels versus mr perfect which again on paper this should have been a fucking hell of a match and even for them phoning it in it was fucking decent but dude you expect so much more out of hitting and sean like completely it's an 11 minute and 20 second yeah. match and i mean you even have diesel who is new to the company right now and he's a hell of a heater for sean and for me this did nothing for either of these guys like this match did fuck all for either of them i know I know it's like you said, it's not, I mean, this is, I'm not sitting here going, oh, this is the worst match Sean was ever involved in. It was the worst. I mean, it's a decent match for both of them, but like when you're throwing around the words, Kurt Hennig and Sean Michaels, generally the words decent match don't work into that conversation. Nope. You know? Yeah. And uh, I don't know. It just, this is something, this is another reason this, this match and just razor being there were like the reasons why I bought a ticket to this event in the first place. And part of me as a kid, cause I think I was, I was either 17 or 18. Part of me when you're a kid, you're like, Oh, that's Mr. Perfect right there. So like, doesn't matter what he does, right. you know? But like, even that later that night when we left, I wasn't like, Oh, I got to see Mr. Perfect. Like I was like, Oh yeah, he, he sure was there. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's how Devin and I feel when we watch a movie for Colson on Saturday. And we're just like, well, that certainly was a movie. Yeah. yeah. That certainly happened. It was probably a, this point in the event where I was just sitting around trying to pinpoint what this entire event reminded me of and it finally dawned on me this is gonna sound like I'm ragging on it even worse but I, I don't mean it to just hear it out it is the wrestling event equivalent to X-Men The Last Stand for me where you look at it on paper and all of the uh, implications of the plot and all of the concepts and everything I really like, you know, like it was an interesting enough plot with enough, I wouldn't say politics in it, but you know what I'm saying? Like it, it was complex enough. It was, it made sense with what the rest of the series was everything. But as you're watching it, even though there's always something going on, you're just like, man, this is dragging. Why am I bored watching this? And that's how I felt pretty much the entire event. Like yeah. it, I was watching it, but dude, I kept looking at my phone like, okay, all right. How long is this shit? Damn. That was only 11 minutes. Yeah. Fuck. It felt like 30. I know. Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you this here. Uh, I, when I was at the actual event at the end of this match, I remember clearly saying to, uh, my buddy who was, uh, who was with me, I remember clearly saying, uh, oh, that's weird. Usually don't see title matches in an account out. Boy, would I come to eat those words later <laughs> on in the evening. But, but like you, in my defense, you usually don't see that. Like no. usually they'll, it, it'll be a dusty finish or something like, you know, and I was like, huh, 
he actually counted to 10. Because, you know, you always see that seven, you know, eight, and then somebody rolls in the ring mm. or nine, nine and a half, you know. And I yeah. when, when the 10 hit and the bell rang, I was like, huh, that's weird. You usually don't see that in a title match. Can we also, uh, yeah, so like the, the match ends, like you said, via count out and Sean retains via count out. But like, there's something else that I just got reminded of. Can we talk about how not consistent the referee's count cadences are on pinfalls yeah. and count outs in this pay-per-view? Because I swear, uh, one of those matches, that motherfucker said, I was like, oh, yeah. hey, buddy, uh, <laughs> you yeah. trying to like, end this shit early? Calling an yeah, audible I was, right yeah. there. Yeah, it's almost like you you can tell, uh, you know, I mean, we all know this is all worked, you know, like this is all, all the outcomes are predetermined, but like, I shouldn't be able to tell when you start your count that this is the actual finish. Right. Moving on to what is a fucking match that should have been on Raw by itself. Erwin R. Scheister and uh, Sean Waltman, the one, two, three kid and a five minute and 44 second singles match. IRS wins. Like I fucking have nothing else to say about this match. Like this is around the era of obviously like Sean going over Razor on Raw and getting the one, two, three kid nickname and his, you know, small push, which one of his better matches was with Brett on Raw. Mm -hmm. Sean, until he did his X Pac gimmick, was again, it felt like he was just another glorified enhancement talent. And sadly enough, the fact that uh, Mike Rotunda was a big fucking deal in the uh, NWA and the 80s, yeah, it would right. have been Mike Rotunda, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this guy rolls in there and looking like yet another glorified enhancement talent being oh. Ted DiBiase's tax man, which great gimmick. He pulled it not the fuck to, off. Not to sidebar shit. too much, but that was one of the first times I clearly remember somebody getting repackaged as a kid. Because I loved Barry Windham and Mike Rotunda as a, as a tag team. And then, you know, when you're a kid, when you're 14, 15, you know, and you don't know this stuff, I remember clearly seeing IRS and being like, he looks just like Mike Rotunda, <laughs> you know, you know, literally like 13 or 14, you know? Yep. And then like a year later, I'm like, Oh, it is Mike. That's okay. They, you know, I didn't believe the guy's name was really Erwin R. Scheister, but like, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that it was exactly the same dude. And I was like, oh, so years later when people get repackaged and stuff, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I know that now. Like, you know, it's just one of those little things you learn as you're growing up. Right. Uh, and then the only other thing I can say is uh, how can I clearly talk about how much I hate Sean Waldman? <laughs> um, okay, you know when people say heat and then they say heel heat and then they say go away heat and then they say X-Pac heat? Okay. I wish I had invented Xbox heat. That's how much I hate Sean. <laughs> like, damn. I don't like anything he's ever done. I don't like him as six. I don't like him as 12. I don't like him as fucking X. I don't like him as one, two, three. I don't like him as any goddamn number or letters. I don't fucking like him as a person. I don't like him in the ring. I think his whole, both of his finishers are the stupidest finishers I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. I don't think anybody who can barely see over the top fucking rope should compete in anything except for the women's <laughs> division. Um, what else? You were in the two most successful factions of the uh, Attitude Era and managed to be the fucking footnote in both. I am not kidding. You know that was prepared. That was all off the top of my head. That's how much I hate X-Pac. So. <laughs> my brother in Christ, I probably can't see over the top rope, man. Well, then you get a match against Alexa Bliss at the next uh, uh, hey, PLE. <laughs> you have no idea what you just gave me permission for, my boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. You're like... You're like, it ain't going to be a WWE PLE, PLE but it's going to be a PLE, all right? It's, yeah. It's going to be over on OnlyFans. Oh, oh. Hey, bro, somebody's getting pinned for sure, boy. Yeah, but I just, I believe I've accurately made it clear how much I can't stand Xbox. He's just not my guy. I just don't, just not my thing. Well, it's a good thing he lost by pinfall in this one. So IRS goes over. In a match that I forgot even happened. Yeah, you're welcome. Until we even talked about it like legitimately yeah. i forgot mm -hmm. not even a joke this is not a bit i forgot no i watched this oh i know there's another match that i forgot took place as well so like when we get to it we we'll just get there watched it yesterday i'm aware how are we forgetting whole matches dude <laughs> We, we we got fucking like flashy stick like the mib we i know got, we got like nailed, what the dude. fuck so we move on to what and this is sad saying this but barely match of the night uh should have been Bret Hart versus Jerry Lawler for the uh, you know undisputed title of King of the Ring because that got set up when Bret won King of the Ring and Lawler came out and 
threw that fucking chair on him. Yeah. Like, yeah. That man was out from blood. And uh, <laughs> we, we go into this match, and Lawler, of course, being the greatest, one of the greatest fucking shit heels there ever was in the business, rolling out there with ice on his knee and crutches <laughs> and all this bullshit. Short story, the later uh we get the uh quote-unquote court jester which is like doing the clown mm -hmm. and what i think is one of the most underrated heel gimmicks ever um heel matt, doink was dude was good matt yeah. matt born doink was mm -hmm. so good i yes. met dusty wolf the guy that portrayed doink for a number of years he worked mm -hmm. for my dad's old wrestling promotion back in the fucking late 90s under the mr wrestling three and doing the clown gimmick nice yeah, he, he was super cool dude. Even he was just like, nobody did it better than fucking Matt Bourne. Right, right, right. Because Matt brought the psychology of an evil mm -hmm. clown, of a bastard fucking clown to the ring and could work. Like the gimmick yeah. wasn't stupid. It, it, he wasn't a jobber at this point. He, he could work. And you stick him in there with Brett, who I dare you to say Brett has ever had like a shit match. I'm sure he's had what was called a shit match, but I would think that was for the talent on the other side of the ring. <laughs> Goldberg and oh boy. I, you, I hate Goldberg. Like you hate X-Pac. So oh, I hate Goldberg as much as I hate X-Pac. So yes, we're good. dude. And, and I remember so many times I was having conversations. Cause like as a small child, cause you got to realize I'm, I'm 26. So as a kid, I was like, yeah, no Goldberg's one of the mans dude. And to this day, I'm like, hey, look, my boy put on a shit match, but still Goldberg. You know, like, it's just, I, I can't, too much of my childhood, I don't know, I, I'm incapable I don't, I don't of mean it. this in a, I, I, I hope this doesn't come out in a no. shitty way towards you because you were young at the time. Gold, I, the thing I understand with Goldberg is that there was a lot of marketing towards young right. people on purpose. It was like, you know, is it my dad can beat up your dad type thing. Like, look exactly. at this guy. He just comes out and he, you know, he beats himself up for a bit and uh, a bunch of fireworks go off and he just annihilates people. And I could totally see like, as a young kid, I could totally see being like, this is the greatest person ever, right. which is how he was marketed. So like, yeah, I totally get you feeling that way about him when he came out. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't do it. Um, <laughs> Fucking so no, no, no. Well, Richie, you're also you're. I mean, you're not as old as me, but you're old. -er, you're old -er enough to where that that type of marketing. I don't think would have went on you. you oh, know I saw I mean? through that shit, dude. I saw through that shit so hard. Like I'm 37. Like I saw mm -hmm. through that shit when it was happening. I was like, yeah. Well, my thing was when it, as soon as it came out, because I'm still again older than you. As soon as Goldberg came through the curtain the first time, I was like, huh, bald goatee, mm. wears black. Doesn't like authority. Where have I seen this? Well, I guess I'll just turn USA back on and see what's yeah. going on. Oh, there's where I saw it before. Exactly. You know? Like coming from yeah. the same fucking creative, yeah, yeah. quote, genius mind that said a man in black <laughs> bro, tights would never bro. get over. Hey, bro. Bro. Are you talking about Vince Russo, bro? <laughs> I'm talking about Eric Bischoff, bro. <laughs> no, I know. But, I know. Uh, bro, I, dude, R Russo can bro, suck it, bro. too. I don't give a fuck if that if this gets out and those bastards hear it. Like Vince Russo, you suck. Bischoff, you you did fuck all for the business other than get yourself and Hogan over. So moving on to um the guy that put asses in fucking seats, uh Brett Hitman Hart goes over Doink the Clown in a nine minute and five second match. Brett Hart worked this pay per view with the flu. It so still insane. did as good as he fucking did. Yep. Insane. Brett worked a shitload of matches sick. He wrestled a fucking title match, intercontinental title match with the Mountie running a 103 degree fucking fever. Dude, yep. I heard that and I was like immediately reminded of Michael Jordan playing that one game with the flu where I yep. could be wrong, but I think he scored 63 points. I think it was something just stupid. Yep. And it's like, bro, how? I don't. Yeah, that's Brett for you. And the match ends by disqualification because Jerry Lawler rolls in there, obviously not hurting, and breaks that crutch over his shoulder, just beats the piss out of him for a hot minute. And then uh, here comes Jack Tunney being like, "Well, Jerry, if you don't wrestle Brett, you will be, you know, he he'll be like banned from the WWF for life or whatever." So we get an impromptu match that should have happened already in less time than Doink's match with Brett. This is pretty much. Brett beating the fucking brakes off of him by the end of this because he sticks him in the sharpshooter for so yeah. long that he wins the match and then doesn't break it for probably like a good two and a half minutes. And 
Then we get one of the one of the first times I remember this decision happening was when the referee would reverse the decision after the match was over for somebody mm-hmm. not relinquishing a hold. And Vince McMahon the whole time at ringside on commentary, like, oh, I can't believe they did that to him, pretty much. And I'm like, bitch, you made the rules in this motherfucker. Like, yes, you did. <laughs> like, yes, you did. You're like, you're like, oh, you can't believe that, Vince? Give it about four years. Yeah. Let's see what you can't believe. Ex- then exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Good match. Um, <laughs> The finish was, it was something, you know, I mean, I, I it was it, like a time killer, honestly. Yeah. It, that's my big issue with it is that two and a half minutes dragged when he just had him in the sharpshooter. It's like, okay. You know how we just had the Slim Jim battle Royal at SummerSlam yeah. th- uh, this past couple weeks ago and how that's kind of like, Hey, we got to get everybody on the card. This was McMahon's version of like, we got to get all the suits on the card. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was too much for my liking. It, it, like I said earlier, just felt like it went on too long. It does, but I mean, it kind of furthers along. Because when you stop and think about the fact that Lawler and Brett had a feud as long as they did, they kept finding ways to like keep that shit going. Yeah, I mean, and I'll give it that, but it's like we were talking off air earlier. It felt like a specific episode of Raw. Yep. Yeah. And so whenever... It's SummerSlam. I feel like SummerSlam is a spot where you either begin stories or cap them off. This felt like it was chapter two out of ten. And granted, it's a very long storyline. I get that. But it's like for SummerSlam, I I feel like I shouldn't get the notion of, oh, I can't wait to tune in on Monday to see what happens next with this storyline. Like, no, I should be feeling a sense of like, Damn, that felt like a conclusion of sorts. Yeah, we got nothing. <laughs> no, all I can do is agree with you. I mean, it's I mean, it's a re, it's, not, it's just restating the same thing over and over, but this this whole show is just not you always hear people say even about bands, you know, oh, they're greater than the sum of their parts. The show is not greater than the sum of its parts. <laughs> mm, right. Is, yeah, the show is severely lacking in the uh in the sum part. So we're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the back half of this pay-per-view, which that does not get any better, even though you've got uh, people like The Undertaker and Yokozuna and Bam Bam Bigelow on the card. You would think. Bam Bam was on there, was he? Yeah. Jesus uh, Christ. Yeah. You're listening to the Super Media Bros on the Odd Pods Media Network. Don't go anywhere. Hey, this is Russ. This is Kyle. This is Michelle. From the Infectious Groove Podcast. Join us every Monday for the most fun you can have with a music podcast. The Infectious Groove Podcast uses a positive and fun approach as we take time every week to share our jammy jams, then dig into a thought-provoking topic discussing all decades and genres of music. You can find the Infectious Groove Podcast on all major podcast platforms, or you can head to infectiousgroovepodcast.com to find us there and subscribe. We might have a controversial opinion here or there, but we always Always have fun with it. Oh, I'm sure I'll say something dumb. Subscribe to the Infectious Groove Podcast, part of the Odd Pods Media Network. Let's go ahead and get into uh, another match that I forgot happened. Mm-hmm. Ludwig Borga versus um, the forgotten rocker, Marty Janetti. Off his rocker, Marty Janetti. Don't Soon give to a be fuck. car crash of a human being, Marty Janetti. Yeah. Um, broke dick ankles, Mar- Marty Janetti. <laughs> I don't like Marty. <laughs> I just, I just yeah. really, like really, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I say Ludwig Borga. I mean, uh, Finnish Brock Lesnar, uh, <laughs> right. Beats his ass and puts him in the human torture rack and wins by submission in five minutes and 15 seconds. I, I could give like a flying fuck less about, uh, Mr. Neon pants here. I will actually give this match one little prop. And that's actually the finish itself. Anytime you have a monster heel submit somebody, especially given the promo package and everything like that, 10 out of 10 times, you are going to see him hold it and the ref have to pull him off and all that other shit. They didn't do that because Ludwig just saw what happened to Brett in storyline. And so they didn't do the same finish twice, but with a different repercussion. Yeah. I will give them that. 
like okay, that, I'll bite. <laughs> yeah, like like that that was okay. And, like I'm I'm almost mad at you because that made so much sense. Yeah, like there was, <laughs> like, it, 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 because, I had continuity because, because I don't I don't want anything good to come out of the show. <laughs> it's true though they had continuity. I'm not saying it was a good match. I'm just saying uh, whoever kept charge of that little detail, good job. That was probably a total yeah. accident too. Yeah. It was better than Nightmare on Elm Street too because it had continuity. <laughs> okay, I will def- I will defend a Nightmare on Elm Street too for a multitude of reasons, but yeah, right. it was. Well, I was gonna say it's better than Halloween three, but that's also got its own merits. Never mind. Yep. What what, what would it be better than if we're going by a Friday Thirteenth Part Five? It's better than Friday Thirteenth Part yeah. Five because it's got continuity. I like five. No, but come on. I like, come on. I like four. You five, gotta and give six. me that one. I'll give you that one though. I do like four, five, and six, but I, I like will four give you and that six. One. Yeah, I like four and six. I don't like uh, uh, Dad's Mad Part Five. Jason goes to hell. It's better than Jason goes to hell. The final Friday. Yeah. yeah there we go. That'll work. Fuck them. The Undertaker versus the Giant Gonzalez Part Two in a Rest in Peace match. Uh, why am I sitting here going, "Fuck this Undertaker match"? So I do. Uh, the only I only have one positive thing to say about this whole thing. It's not even positive. It's just a funny observation. <laughs> so this was the first time I was ever in the same building with the Undertaker. Okay, so I had never seen like the lights go out or heard the gong or or the the music or anything. Okay, so and you may want to like I've never in my life said this to somebody, but you may want to go back and watch this footage again from '93 uh, Summer Slam to, to get the full scope of what I'm talking about. So you know when the Undertaker comes out on any event ever, um, yeah, the lights go out, but like there's always still like the the arena lights are still on, like the you know the the section lights and stuff. In like the 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 event stuff. Okay, if you watch this, that the whole palace went pitch black. Like you can't see your hand in front of your face when the Undertaker came out. And it, here's the thing: it was that I was up in the corridor when the Undertaker started his entrance. I was up like uh, at the concession stands. The fucking lights went out there too. Like the whole palace went pitch ass black dark. Like they would you if, uh, if, like in the last ten years or so. <sighs> undertaker coming out they would never black out the entire arena including the uh you know uh, the, i like but if you watch when you if you go back and watch the undertaker's entrance again from this look up the steps and stuff you'll see you can't see into the corridors the whole dude, palace was pitch ass black dude imagine a kid coming back yeah. from the bathroom with his parents and that little bastard yep. just fucking dude, i was like shit. I, was, I was 18 and i was like where's my dad like, you know what i mean like, <laughs> oh, i'm talking to you you literally, the whole goddamn palace went out. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face in the fucking wow. corridor until the Undertaker got, got, like, all of us just stood in place. And, it, like, you know, when he does the thing where he l- raises his hands and the lights come up, like, all the lights came up, and we were all like, okay, can we resume our lives now? Like, it was <laughs> it was the weirdest thing. So, it, fast forward to the Attitude Era, you know, we're in the smoky-ass Joe Louis Arena, and anytime the Taker comes out or whatever else, like, it's like less than half a blackout. And I always wanted to be like, this is not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> you, but none of you know, when, you know, when I was a kid, I pissed my pants in the bathroom because I couldn't yeah. see anything. Yeah. It's like, all yeah, right, when we cool. were a kid. We couldn't see, but I'm serious. Like, it was the first time I ever saw the Undertaker come out. It was totally unique. Cause I never saw him do another. I saw him, Jesus. I don't know. 10, 15 more times after that uh, in person. And I, ne- it was never anything close to that as far as the blackout. Cool. Oh, and then the rest of the match was happened, and it was awful. Yeah, mm-hmm. Undertaker won with a top rope clothesline, and uh, the Giant Gonzalez's bodysuit was even more tan than he was, which I thought was not even a possible fucking feat. Oh, and then Paul Bearer was gone at some point, and he comes back to the ring instead of like carrying like the urn or a bigger urn. He comes to the ring with a wreath, and um, McMahon and Heenan are selling that like a fucking gunshot on on commentary and it's like dude it's a fucking black floral wreath like who gives a shit this is not a casket match this is not anything special a rest in peace match was supposed to be no count out no disqualification and they put neither of those stipulations to use not really no yeah just dumb like far and away the most interesting part of the whole thing for me was the takers entrance because i was we like if i was if i was down in my seat i wouldn't have known that the whole damn building blacked out you yep. know what I mean? Like I happened to be up in the corridor when it happened. Yeah. And then we move on to the semi, uh, well, I would say semi main event. It is the penultimate match of the night. It is Tataka and the smoking guns, which is a really oh, fucking yeah. weird pairing versus Bam Bam Bigelow and the head shrinkers. 
two of these guys are eventually going to go to Money Incorporated in mm-hmm. a little over a year and a half's time. The head shrinkers are the fucking head shrinkers. I, I will watch anything they do because they are at least entertaining. I, right. I, I like Afa. I like Sika, like the old guys, but then I, I like Samu and Fatu for, you know, those of you that don't know, uh, Fatu is uh, also known as Rikishi, who is also the Uso's daddy. Looking very Usi in this pay-per-view. Actually. He was. <laughs> Uh, this was a fine match for a six man tag. I, I will watch anything that Bam Bam does. I have said this before several times on this podcast and I will continue to say it. I think Bam Bam Bigelow was one of the best, if not the actual best big man in the business. He was so agile. He moved like a little dude and he worked his ass off him and he mm-hmm. made, he made his shit look fucking believable when he, when he was yep. laying it in. And he just looked badass with the fucking head flames and everything. Yep. Like I can't, I cannot badmouth that dude at all. Even the shit he did in ECW, fantastic shit. Tatanka, I love that dude. I, I loved him as a kid. I still like watching him work. Uh, he's he's the quintessential like good guy for like little kids and shit. It was so weird seeing him do a heel run later on, but very believable as a heel. This match, uh. It, like I said, this was filler, but it was actually like a decent filler. Like it's one of the only positives of this pay per view, honestly. A couple of things I want to say. Number one, uh, Tatanka has the distinction in my mind of um, he has my favorite Howard Finkel uh, introduction, which is always every time Tatanka, my favorite. <laughs> yes. I, like, have far and away my favorite thing, other than and new. That's like, my favorite thing that uh, Finkel ever said was Tatanka's name. Uh, other than that, though, what's funny is like what this should be a filler match, but it ends up being a highlight of the night because nearly everybody else phoned it in up till this point, right? Yeah. So like, you and it's weird saying that because head shrinkers are not guys that would phone stuff in. Billy and Bart, whatever you like to say about you know Bart and what he, the lack of what he went on to do, and and uh, you know everything else Billy got involved in, and in Tatali, you said Tatanka had a weird turn there, but like all of these names are not people that you would ever be like you would ever say, oh, well, we'll put them in the filler match, right? And I almost feel like everybody in the match probably worked a little bit harder because they were like, you know what? Like, this is bullshit. Like, all the people who should have been working harder than us didn't, you know? Is there a reason why everything felt phoned in? Because it was on American soil. It's not like, even if it was like a Saudi Arabia match, okay? Like, if somebody were to have phoned it in their first match out there, because they were like, man, this feels fucking wrong for me blah 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 something like that i'd be like okay i mean you're still at work buddy but uh, okay what was the story to this like what you know what you don't what's funny is this is like the totally forgotten event like no there's like wrestlers and managers and and financing guys and anybody involved in sports entertainment will especially in the podcast era they will all sit around talk to whoever about the same stuff over and over and over, mm-hmm. right? Like the Royal Rumble 92 and uh, Survivor Series 97 and Bash of the Beach 2000 and all this stuff that gets talked. No one has anything to say about the show, like ever. Like nobody ever brings the show up. It never gets talked about. Having said all of that, uh, I, I on the way outside looking in, I feel like Richie kind of hit the nail on the head earlier. I bet if you were to ask some of the people involved in the show, I bet a lot of them just felt like they got their marching orders from Vince. Like, Hey, I know this doesn't make sense, but we got to put you on the card. So like, just go do this match. And I feel like, like you said, you're still at work and you're still getting paid. Right. But I feel like a lot of these guys were like, nothing about this makes any sense. There's barely any push to any of this. So like, sure. Pay me and I'll go out and do a match. Like if you, if you want to call it SummerSlam, that's on you, you know, Mm. but like, I'm going to go out and work this match that was put in front of me. But don't you feel like Richie? I know you've listened to and you've watched all this YouTube content, all this shit I have. And listen, isn't it weird that no one ever talks about anything to do with the show? Like ever? Yes and no. It's weird because it's like it's fucking SummerSlam, but it's not weird because it was SummerSlam 93. Like, no, I up. know, but that doesn't. No. Yeah, but, no, but like, what you're everyone, it's, everyone acknowledges that it's such a bad show. Sure. Yeah. But like no one ever talks about the hows and whys of it ever. Yeah, and I don't I don't think that there's really anything that you know, it almost felt like uh they did the King of the Ring for the first time as a pay-per-view this year and it, that was much more important uh storyline-wise and a yeah. lot of other things. And this felt very much like, well, we have to do something between now and Survivor Series and we yeah. have to further along whatever the fuck we're selling at Survivor Series, which uh, let's let's go ahead and 
wrap up the fact that like Tatanka and Smoking Guns went over in 11 minutes and 15 seconds. Um, keeping with what I was about to say, moving into uh, Lex Luger versus Yokozuna for the WWF Heavyweight Championship in a 17 minute and 58 second match, which shouldn't have even been like fucking 16 minutes and 58 seconds. Mm-hmm. Um, they were leaning really hard into the all American shit versus a quote very heavily or quote Japanese man, which I know. Uh, come on, man. Rodney and Noy, <laughs> Yokozuna. I get what they were going for, but my God, Devin pointed this shit out. That man lets his hair down. Oh no, that is a motherfucking Samoan. <laughs> yeah, right, fucking, right, right. There, there's no know. like even as a kid, like I bought it because he had his hair tied and Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like like that I understood, but dude, once he let his hair down, I was like, I it's impossible for me to go back in time and show little kid me this, but at the same point, I'm thinking, okay, I, I grew up watching Lilo and Stitch, okay? I, I know that's a cartoon, but, like, they they drew them pretty accurate to how the people of Hawaii look. Yeah. I feel like I would have looked at that man and went, oh, you kind of look Hawaiian, okay. Like, that's what I would have thought, you know? Uh, I don't... Yeah. I don't know, dude. Like that. Well, I, for me, there's a couple issues here, and this all comes in. Like I literally, I, I talked about this earlier. I assure you, not one person in that building bought a ticket for this main event. Not one person no. in that building. Okay. Nope. And there's two issues with it. Number one, um, I, yeah, I was like 17, 18 at the time, and uh, I don't think any of us questioned that Yokozuna was was uh, Japanese at the time because you just you know you just go along with what you're told, and you're like, I don't know, maybe sure, maybe he's Japanese, you know. But the thing is. You know, in the mid eighties, like in the middle of the cold war, like you can do Hogan versus Sheik, you know, Mm -hmm. and certainly at the at the top of desert storm, you can do Hogan versus uh, slaughter. But like in 93, man, this whole like USA, USA, like you can't anchor the entire show on that. Like there wasn't in 93, there was no like U S versus everyone else thing happening in the world at that time. And so it's, it's like, not only do you have this guy now that we have the benefit of hindsight, looking at going wow, like how off the mark racially are you, you know, but like at the time, like nobody in the, it had nothing to do with Lex Luger, which is its own argument about how Lex Luger really shouldn't be the face of any company. Like it it didn't have anything to do with that. Like none of us in there were like, I I can't stand Luger. It's just like, none of us were like, do it for the USA, Lex. Like none of us cared about that aspect, like at all, like at all, nobody cared about that and when you take that they could have like done a million other things like fake an injury where like yoko's in a uh you know breaks one of lex's legs or whatever and he's got to come back from that or so like any of that would have resonated with the crowd especially a detroit crowd right like always needing to come back of being the underdog or whatever right like that would have resonated with the crowd so much more than like faux usa ism you know like it was just it, it was such a weird it's a weird thing. I honest to God, it's probably the only show I've ever been to in my entire life where literally no one bought a ticket for the main event. Like by the time the main event happened, and this is what I was going to talk about earlier, we were all tolerating being in the building. <laughs> Fuck. It, like we were all just like, oh shit. And also that other match is going to happen. I fucking believe it because yeah. the stipulation with this match also is that if Luger loses, he doesn't get another shot at the title as long as Yokozuna is champion. Now, a uh, shitload of wasted time later because I'm not even going to break this match down. It is literally like a longer version of Luger showing up to body slam him on the fucking USS Intrepid. So we get the whole Lex Express thing. Lex Luger has been repackaged from the narcissist gimmick, which again, I don't feel like anybody should have bought into this bullshit whatsoever. It's like you go from like the most arrogant prick muscle head dude. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to be this all American guy because they were trying to basically give us the next Hulk Hogan and Lex mm-hmm. Luger would never be uh, the next Hulk Hogan. He was never Lex Luger. Uh, the motherfucker wore the wrong ties to the ring. They should have been fucking green. Because the motherfucker was as green as goose shit his entire fucking run. I don't give a shit what anybody says. I thought Luger was one of the worst goddamn workers in the history of this sport. Yeah. And to to back up on another thing you just said, the whole that we're trying to give you the next Hogan, like they hit on the wrong thing. If you're going to mold somebody after Hogan, okay, Hogan's whole bit at that time was not just USA, USA, USA. Like, yeah, he'd been in two big angles with where the USA was the thing, right? But like 
there was more to Hogan's character than that. Okay. And they gave, like I say, even if they just did, even if they did, uh, Yokozuna put Lex's leg up against the, uh, the turnbuckle and, you know, did a bonsai drop on it and broke quote, broke his leg in storyline. Right. And Lex had to come from back from that. That would have been more Hogan than doing the just like they rested the whole thing on Lex loves the USA. And like all of us in the crowd were kind of like, and <laughs> you, know, like, you know what I mean? Like, and what else does Lex do? You know what I mean? Like, why, how can your entire character or how can you expect an entire arena of people to root for the face on that one thing? Like, I also don't hate where we are in this country. You know what I mean? Like, how is that, you know? So the only other thing I was going to point out earlier, and I want to say this before I forget, is it, this is the only other thing I would tell you to go back and rewatch on this. When you see that that count out happen, look at the stairwells. Literally, oh, yeah, people are filing everybody the fuck out. in that place is just like, and it, but it's not. You've seen you see when people get, uh, get mad at a finish and they leave, right? This is not people being mad at the finish. This is people going, "Oh fuck, thank God!" Like, like, okay, good, because <laughs> literally everybody was just tolerating that match. Just like everybody there was just tolerating that match. And then the second it was like, ding, ding, ding. I, there wasn't, when we were going up the stairway, we were all confused because we all did what everybody else did. When you watch the show, we turned around. I remember clearly turning around, walking up the steps and being like, why the fuck is Lex up on their fucking show? What? Like what? And then, and then we're in the car. We were like, did we miss something? Did Lex win? Or like, but no one cared enough to know. Like right. we weren't arguing about it. Like, no, you missed and this happened. All of us were like, huh, did, huh, well, okay, whatever. Like, you know what I mean? Like, absolutely no one cared. Yeah, because that was the weirdest fucking thing to me and to you too, Devin. Because yeah. like, okay, so like part of the gimmick with this is that, you know, uh, when Lex is a baby face at this point, he mm. is um, he is required to wear the forearm pad as per Jim Cornette and Mr. Fuji because uh Luger famously in real life was in a motorcycle accident that caused him to have to have a metal uh, plate uh, in his forearm. So the running forearm was his finishing maneuver for the longest time because of that. Right. So for this, they, they would always make him wear the elbow pad because it was a DQ if not. So when the referee is distracted, Luger pulls the forearm pad up, knocks Yoko out of the ring for the 10 count. And that's it now to Russ and your point also Devin and to a lot of people that watch this fucking show, Again, why the fuck would you celebrate like you just won the championship and like yeah. all this pomp and circumstance, no pun intended for Mr. Savage, uh, all this pomp and circumstance happening with like balloons dropping and confetti dropping and he's getting lifted on their shoulders and waving the flag. It's like there was no major conflict happening to where this victory meant shit anyway. And, right. and if you didn't yep. get the championship, like how, why would you celebrate basically fucking yourself out of a title yeah. shot for over almost a year. I don't understand it. Like, couldn't you, I don't know. I, I'm trying to write it out of that corner. Cause it's like, well, couldn't you just go out and get Yokozuna? It's Yokozuna. You, you not picking that fucker up and putting him in the ring. He sold that goddamn forearm through the end credit video package, the backstage interview, and then they still came back and he was still out of the, out, on the outside of the ring. But it was fucking hilarious just to hear Bobby Heenan be like, someone help Yoko. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't they just do this in the ring? Like, did they just not want to put the title on Lex? Like, dude, it would, I hate to say this, but it would have been the wrong fucking move to put the title on him at that time. I mean, no. yeah, but it's just like, why were they so dead set on having Lex come out victorious, I guess, is my question. Lack of options. Yep. Lack of options protects Yokozuna from looking bad by losing it to a pinfall, and it also protects Lex Luger from looking bad losing to this guy on, on American the, soil. It's so dumb. How, how does one look bad by losing against the champion, though? Especially if it's Yoko. I, 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 make it make sense. I wish I could. The WWE in... in, in the, the summer and fall of 93 is an accurate picture of what happens when you don't prepare for the expected and the unexpected. Mm -hmm. Right. So like you have people aging out at that time who 
are just not going to capture the hearts and minds of younger people anymore. Right. And you have people coming up who like, aren't there yet. Like, uh, like again, as much as I hate him, uh, Waltman went on to be a big thing. Right. But he's like, not even close to like in the discussion at this time of being like a big deal, you know, and you don't have, you have heels like uh Borga that people like, are, you know, it's just there. Like nobody, somebody vehemently hates, you know, uh, and then you have like the whole steroid scandal, which knocked out a huge part of the, uh, roster rate before this. Uh, so they should have expected that they needed to be bringing people up that the audience would care about. And that would have helped cover for the unexpected, which was like the steroid scandal and people moving on, uh, or, or even like with, uh, what happened with Hellwig where he just like, you know, all of a sudden, uh, like went batshit and quit again and, and whatever. Right. Like I still, I still, even though warriors are loose cannon, like that's, I filed that under unexpected at that time. Right. So they were had zero plan for the expected or the unexpected. Right. And this is what happens. You end up with people to me, we, you know, when uh, I know y'all are friends with the um, attitude era uh, review podcast, we, uh, well, I've been on there several times and we've come up with this uh, uh, term uh, seven thirty booking uh, for, meaning like, you know, for raw or, uh, Nitro, you can tell when the 730 somebody went, fuck, we got to get those guys on the card, you know, and then like put yep. together a shitty, uh, shitty match. And, you know, it makes no sense. Very this last whole, minute. this whole card up to and including, uh, the ridiculous main event and the, and the non finish of it, uh, all reeks of 730 booking. Like they all got to the palace that day and we're like, Hmm, anybody think what we're supposed to do at the ends of all these matches? No, you did shit. Who was supposed to do that? You know, and then they like just went on the said, all right, here's here's how they'll all end. And nobody stopped to think how dumb the ending of the main event was. And also, I wonder, too, if they're just like, fuck, people don't give a shit about this anyways. Who fucking cares how this ends? You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of how I, it, I do wonder that. Yeah, that's kind of how it looked. And it's how yeah. it felt on paper. Um, like McMahon <laughs> being like, dude, fuck it. You just have you just have lack of options. You have nothing to do. Uh, you know, there's. Let me put it this way. I would put the question back to you, Devin, and say this. How do you book this? To this, and like, I mean, you don't get to go, uh, oh, well, I would have put so-and-so in the match. No, you're stuck with this match. Fuck. You know what I mean? What yeah. do you do? You know? It's lack of planning that led us to leave being left with this match. And so like, it's there's, no, uh, there's no good outcome. No, because really the match, you, you, even on paper, you look at it, it's like, well, who's the workhorse? Who, who's the one that's actually carrying the match? So yeah. you shouldn't even have done it to begin with. But if you were going to, as a finish, dude, dog, th this is one of the occasions where it's like, you, you hate criticizing without construction to it, but it's like, what, what else is there? Like I yeah. said, you shouldn't have done it to begin with. There's, yep. there's nothing there. I feel like the the only way I could see this being booked any other way than what we got, Cornette doing um his bidding by being like, okay, no, no, you have to wear this forearm pad. Luger hits Yokozuna with the forearm. Cornette and Fuji see this happen, and they are all of a sudden justified in cheating to win because Luger was cheating to win. And I mean, you could you could have had the ref not see that bump happen, but you could have like salted Luger's eyes or you see him pull the forearm pad up. He's going to run at Yokozuna. Fuji's already on the apron. Salt him in the fucking eyes. Yoko hits a belly to belly. Uh, fucking bonsai drops his ass, pins him in the ring. Fans are pissed off. Of course, they're fucking pissed off. Luger doesn't get his rematch. Well, he wasn't going to get his fucking rematch anyway with his finish. Right. Send, send Yoko home with a divisive, a decisive victory and even more heel heat. Mm -hmm. And then you have Luger chasing the fucking like, how am I going to get a title shot? Which not happening to the Rumble 94. It gives Yoko even more mega heat. And then, you know, it makes the Survivor Series match that happens in November a little more uh, meaningful for Luger to get his hands on Yokozuna, at least in some fucking form or fashion for some, you know, revenge or whatever. But I would have booked a dirty finish from Fuji, Cornette, and Yokozuna conspiring to beat Luger because then Luger could be like, well, 
that just proves he, your man couldn't have beat me. But then Cornette and them being like, you couldn't beat Yoko without the fucking forearm. So like mm. it, it creates, you know, uh, some tension there that can right. last anything yeah. would have been better than the bullshit we fucking got for this. Yep. Yeah. And that's just fucking armchair booking. It's, it, that ain't. And like I tell you, man, I, I shit you not all the way up the stairway the corridor in the car on the way home. All of us were like, what? Like, what did I? Did you miss something? Did I miss something? And the biggest thing is everybody in the car was like, I don't know. I, I didn't care enough to like really know what was, you know what I mean? Like I'm not high enough I, for this shit. Yeah. I think of enough. I can think of so many other events where on the way home, we talked about it and everything. And people were like, <laughs> like, Oh yeah. Okay. This, that, and the other thing or whatever else. Oh, okay. Like, okay. I get where we've all like thought our way through it. And like it, with this, literally everybody in the car was like, I don't know. I wasn't, I didn't care enough about the main event to like remotely, you know, it just, it just is what, like I said, the only, the only way I can keep, I know I keep reiterating the same point, but the only way I can make it clear is literally no one in that building cared anyways. So I feel like they were just like WWF was like, whatever, you know, like who really cares? <laughs> the, it's the whatever wrestling federation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's no like, kidding. fuck it. But yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's SummerSlam 1993 from um, Auburn run to the Hills in Michigan uh, as the crowd yeah. would probably call it at that point. I, I feel like we've pretty much, I was going to say final thoughts on this, but I think we've kind of left it all out on the goddamn yeah, table. Just like I said, just bored. Nothing on it aside from the very last minute was offensively bad. I just struggled to get through it. The only positive I can say is that it, it leans itself into well, maybe Survivor Series will be a little better and it's not much better, but at least at Survivor Series, we're getting set up for what, in my opinion, was a pretty fucking stellar year for the company on paper and, and in some of the events in 1994. Sure. Mm-hmm. Because when we come back to the Time Machine Series with WWF, we will be talking about Survivor Series 1993 in November. Well, I can tell you this, when you, uh, whenever the time machine rolls around to Survivor Series 1999, that's another one I was at, where we rolled into that building all excited to see Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> oh, boy. And, th- and then guess what happened? Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you get around to that one, uh, I was there for that, too. <laughs> so <laughs> We'll definitely be calling you, <laughs> for yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. At, least, at least that's a better show overall, but then again, everything's a better show than SummerSlam 93. So oh, Right. Russ, tell all the fine people out there listening uh, what you do, where they can come listen to you guys, and where they can come watch you guys at. Because uh, Russ uh, does amazing music content uh, on on the podcast, Infectious Groove, and also on the YouTube channel that they do uh, over there. Great work. But I'm going to let this man give you the sales pitch. Yeah, yeah. Everything we do is all uh, three music videos a week over on YouTube. So in uh, youtube.com slash Infectious Groove. And all you got to do is come find the channel and subscribe. We have videos come out on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Uh, we just recently, by popular demand from the audience, got in the music reaction game. So our videos every Saturday are uh, reaction videos to uh, live performances and music videos and all that stuff. It seems to be going well so far. Uh, and then our Tuesday and Thursday videos are always, uh, uh, they follow the same uh, scope that we used to have on the infectious group podcast, which was um, all positive. So we don't do any of the uh, five overrated or five uh, uh, overhyped or anything like that. We do underrated, we do great stuff. And uh, so we do a bunch of different series that are just positive ways to look at music. If there's an artist or a song or an album or a genre that we don't like, we don't talk about it. Uh, there's plenty of other channels out there where you can hear people, bitch and moan and complain about things they don't like and that isn't us uh so if that's what you're looking for don't come subscribe to our channel uh but if you are looking for a voice of positivity in the world and maybe songs that you haven't heard in a while or uh artists that uh, you haven't heard from or heard of then that's the channel you're looking for so check that out and if you want to get to that channel i will provide a link in the show notes below so just scroll up and click that shit go there and hit subscribe button god damn it and hit the notification bell I know every creator says that all the time on YouTube, but that is like as important as hitting the subscribe button because YouTube, even though we put out three uh, videos a week and you have told YouTube that you would like to see our videos because you hit subscribe, you literally will not know that we put out our three videos every week unless you also hit the notification bell. Yeah, because YouTube has a shitty habit of just burying your asses in the it algorithm. It is insane. It is absolutely insane how uh, like how you get hidden like if somebody subscribes to something, 
you would think automatically YouTube would be like, hey, that thing that you have told us that you like. That's but, but nope. You know, when you see creators and videos going, please say, make sure to hit that bell. Like I'm telling you from experience, it absolutely. Uh, I've we've had we've had people sub- that have been subscribed to our channel for six months, uh, seven months, and they'll catch a video literally on accident and then be like, oh, I thought you guys stopped putting videos out. Like I haven't, you know, I, I didn't have any idea that you guys. And I'm like, yeah, we put three out every week. They're like, oh, I, I missed like three or four, seven, six, seven months worth of content because I had no idea. So, yeah. Shit. Yeah, my brain hurts on that one. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's it's ridiculous. So, and part of it too is and I don't mean to, you know, be like, oh, what was me? But part of it too is you do get more clicks with sensational stuff. You know, like mm-hmm. oh, this is the most overrated. Oh, this is the worst thing ever or, you know, and all that stuff. But I that's not what we do. So, I'm not, you know, going for the and I could. I could complain up a storm about a bunch of music I don't like, but I don't want to. Well, so. that well, I'm going to put worst SummerSlam ever on the fucking title for this goddamn shit. <laughs> you, you should. I dude, I guarantee you, I'm not being funny when I say this. You will get way more clicks with that than even <laughs> if you're like a constructive discussion about SummerSlam, you will get way less clicks. Or if you're like, uh, you know, like we uh, firsthand account of SummerSlam 93, you will get way less clicks than if you're not like worst thing that's ever happened to anyone <laughs> ever. Russ, thank you very much for coming to hang out and do this with us, man. Um, it, it, it was much more uh fun to talk about having you on here uh i i I like talking wrestling with you in general because like russ and i will go back and forth either on on twitter or just over text messages about about you know specific wrestling matches like when when we think about it (laughs) but it's always fun to have a discussion you know especially when you know the people at the table like have either been there grew up on it or just knowledgeable about the shit right I will say this, and this is the biggest compliment I can pay uh, you to, is discussing this with you tonight was far more fun than when I sat through it in in person. And when I just watched it last night uh, (laughs) for the first time since I sat through it in person, (laughs) this discussion was far more entertaining than that. So I will uh, let me send that tip to your listeners. If you're listening to any of this and you're going, oh, there's no way it's as bad as they say. Yes, it is. It's uh, I was there. It's it's as bad as we are saying it is. Don't go watch that. Just listen to this episode again instead of going to watch SummerSlam 93. That's right. (laughs) But if you would like to uh, listen to more wrestling content, visit SuperMediaBrosPodcast.com for past, present and future episodes. Check out all the other shows, including the Infectious Groove podcast on the Odd Pods Media Network. Uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on social media. Uh, leave us a rating and review at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, and Podchaser. You know, all that jazz. All right, everybody. Uh, this has been SummerSlam 1993 from Auburn Hills, Michigan, episode 289. Good God. Please come back and hang out with us when we do Survivor Series 1993. It's guaranteed to be much more of a blast than this piece of shit. (laughs) Until next time, I've been Richie. I'm Devin. Shades on. We're off.